Hi, I'm Kristen Denny Chambers, clarinetist composer and founder of Clarinet Playground. This is video number eight out of 40 from the Finger Fitness Etudes Book Two collection, going through each etude with little tips and tricks to help you along the way as you get started. This is Bohemian Dance. Bohemian Dance is dedicated to Annie Lenore Rambler. Of course, I know her as Annie Lenore, or maybe even just as Annie. I first met Annie in 2000 at my very first ICA convention when it was held at OU in Norman. She stood out and was quite a character. Anyone who met her or heard her play never forgot it. I honestly think she was way ahead of her time. The things she did with the clarinet are the kinds of things that people wish they could do now. Sadly, Annie passed away, and I want to share a little bit of a tribute that her sister Jane wrote for her. Annie had two musicians as parents, so she was raised in a very musical environment. We grew up in Tampa, Florida, where my dad taught in public schools and performed in local orchestras as well. Annie was a prodigy of sorts, playing with the Tampa Philharmonic when she was 14, soloing with her high school band at the New York World's Fair, winning competitions, and attending many festivals, including Brevard and Interlochen, while she was still a student. She was brilliant at solfege at five years old, reciting entire Mozart symphonies in the backseat of the car on long trips. She studied privately with David Weber in New York and considered him her greatest influence. At Oberlin, she studied with George Wall. To quote the esteemed teacher and clarinetist Larry Guy, Annie was my teacher at Oberlin. After college, she pursued a different path, playing blues, jazz, swing, Celtic, and other styles, doubling on flute, violin, and voice. Annie was a brilliant, intuitive musician with deep insights into sound, technique, and phrasing. As a teacher, she was meticulous, funny, warm, and loving, and set very high standards for herself and her students. She was constantly arranging, composing, and creating projects for herself and her students to motivate and inspire them. She called herself a people's musician in the broadest sense of immersing herself in the many languages of music and sharing freely with everyone. A total character, funny and outspoken, most people never forgot her. She loved the clarinet, and when she was sick with cancer and in hospice, she said to me, I just want to play my clarinet. I miss her so much. I'm very thankful to Jane for sharing this beautiful tribute with me. Of course, I'll never forget Annie, and if you knew her, I'm sure you'll never forget her either. Let's take a look at the music. Be sure to look at the bottom of each page of these etudes. There's always at least one or two practice tips. For this one, we have carefully study and plan fingerings in measure 8 and 12, and plan ahead for pinky choices in measure 20. We'll be taking a look at those measures very soon. Also, play the B octave gestures in a way that mimics how a violinist might slide their finger up the string. This is like a glissando or a portamento effect on the violin. At the top of each page, you'll find two finger drills. These are very important because this is what's folded directly into the music and the main challenge for the etude. For this one, we have B to D sharp. So we want to lean in to that side key with as little motion as possible, and then keep your middle finger of your right hand kind of hovered over and ready to return right back to that middle open hole on the right hand. This is meant to be some side key work, so no one over two cheating at all on this one. So we want to really work that interval. The style and character of this piece is quickly dancing with a folk-like character. We want to clip notes of slurs before staccato, and especially the staccato notes at the end of the slurs, usually these B octave gestures. We'll look at those here in just a minute. And then also be sure to show the accents and the dynamic contrast. There are some built-in echoes, and you want to really show those. I'll play the first two measures, and it is also repeated as the third and fourth measure at a quieter dynamic. So that's where we want to prepare for the echo. Now I'll take a look at measure seven and eight. At the end of measure eight, we have a B octave glissando, and then in measure seven, we have the E to B. Both are to be treated the same way, this sort of dramatic glissando effect that you might hear on a violin, playing something very folksy with a rhapsodic sort of character. Of course, we are not going to glissando on the clarinet itself, but we want that energy to mimic that style. The rhythm in this etude is pretty straightforward. There are quite a few 16th notes, but you will find some dotted 8th 16ths mixed in, as well as 8th 2 16ths and 2 16ths and an 8th. 
And then any of the longer held values, you want to make sure they are played their full value, like the quarter notes and dotted quarter notes. I subdivide a lot to make sure that I'm very accurate with my rhythm. So this section of the music I'll play slowly and subdivided for you. And here's a take of me playing what you see here on the page. Now we'll get into some areas to focus on specifically in this etude. There are quite a few, so hang on with me. The opening motive has its own traps in it, so we want to really plan our pinkies in advance. You have two options here. You can play your F sharp on the right side and your E sharp, which is really just an F natural. You can play that on this side. So that would be right for F sharp, left for E sharp. The other option is to do left for F sharp over here and right for your E sharp, which is just F natural. I tend to favor the right side F sharp and left side E sharp on this one, mainly because of measure two. In measure two, I want to play B to F sharp on this side. That's more comfortable to me and it's more accurate for me. So because I choose that, then I'm going to do the right side at the beginning to keep consistent with my F sharp choice. The next thing we'll look at are the B octave gestures in measure eight, 12, and 20. Those measures also have quite a few little finger traps in them, so we'll look at those individually as well. So let's start with measure eight. So we've got F sharp in the key, and then we've got the E sharp. So we can play D, and then we could go to our side F sharp, which is your thumb, bottom two, side keys. And then we could let go of those side keys to play our E sharp, which is really just F natural. And then we can go back to the side key and then prepare for our middle finger F sharp. Now, it may be too clumsy for you to do that, and that's totally understandable. I, I've struggled with it in trying to decide what I'm going to do there, and I, I change my mind all the time. So sometimes I will flip-flop. So I'll go from D, then I'll go to my first finger F sharp, I'll flip to the thumb, and then go back to the F sharp, and then I'm up here. Another thing is you can mix and match. So you might go D, side key, thumb, and then flip to the front, or you might play D, front with the F sharp, thumb, and then the side key. So there are a lot of options with measure eight. You just mess around and try to figure out what's going to help you be the most consistent and the most reliable with that. Now we look at measure 12. Here we kind of have to flip flop. So this is where we want to get really comfortable with a flip under a slur from F sharp in the middle to E sharp, which is really just F natural, and then back to the F sharp in the middle. Those are tricky. Now we look at measure 20, and this is where we need to prepare our pinkies in advance. Just practice them, mark them in, and make sure it's consistent. So you can do left Bs and right C sharps throughout, or you can do right Bs and left C sharps throughout. I tend to favor left B to right C sharp. I like the closeness of it, how my fingers are closer into the instrument. I'm not having to stretch as much. Now I'll go back and play these three examples for you. Similar to the B octaves, we also have some leaps that are a little bit smaller in the intervals. So in measure five, seven, and way down at measure 26, we have these same sort of gestures like I was trying to get in those octaves, just a smaller interval. So in measure five, we have the jump from E to B, same thing in measure seven. And then in 26, the final thing is that D sharp to B just before the big jump down with the grace note. So we wanna still treat those with that same energy, that sort of glissando violin energy or that little sparkle that you might get in that sound and kind of really blow through, give a lot of energy to the first note and really blow through to connect to the upper note. Here's measure five, seven, and 26.
Measures 16 and 26 could easily catch you off guard. They're a little different than anything else you've seen so far. So measure 16 is kind of a transition with, with this slurred figure. It's kind of chromatic, but not really. So you want to really be ready for it. We go from G natural, A natural, A sharp, and then fork for B, C sharp, D, E, and land on the F sharp. Now I've played 26 for you already, but we were mostly focusing on that gesture at the end, the D sharp to B. But now we need to think about the fact that this starts with the main motive way down low, and then we have to connect the registers and get all the way to that high B. And as you connect the registers, if you have a traditional clarinet setup like I do without the extra E flat key, E flat, A flat key, then you have to, to play right on the B, left on C sharp and right on D sharp as you connect the registers across. So prepare that in advance, make sure you're really comfortable with it because we really wanna have a strong ending. Of course, anytime we're playing something, we want the final thing to be you know, very clean. So start at the end here and make sure this last couple of measures are really solid. Here's measure 26 again. <laughs> Now I want to backtrack to one more thing. In measure 21 to 22, there's this little section of music leading to the fermata. Now at first sight, it seems pretty simple. However, we are connecting to that B natural, and that is a huge shift on the clarinet. So we have that resistance of the B paired with the G natural and the F sharp, which has very little resistance, and we're constantly going back and forth across the register. So here are some things that I do to try to make that a little bit more cohesive and you know keep the volume the same so that nothing jumps out. Like those Bs could really jump out easily for you. So here are some things that I do to think about that. So number one, I focus on the energy of the air on the G and the F sharp so it can match the Bs. And then I can also use my right hand down, so all of these fingers, plus my right side B key when I'm playing the open G. And that can really help to, to make that transition easier. And then when I get to the F sharps, of course we have to lift the right hand fingers here, but that B key down here at the bottom, that can stay planted on the F sharp. So if you practice it really slowly, you can train yourself to do that. So you get right hand down plus the B for open G, you connect to the B, and then when you go to F sharp, you just lift those fingers, but you keep your pinky planted. If you practice that really slowly, it could really help to you know gel this section and make sure it's really smooth. And then the last thing that I do is I practice high, low, high when I have register shifts, and I'll play that so you understand what I'm talking about. I'll pick the B, and then I'll play open G and go right back to the B. So I'm matching the energy in my air and the, the, the crossing of the registers is really smooth. So I'll do B, G, B, and then I'll do B, F sharp, B. And now I'll put all that in context and play this example for you. Now for some final thoughts on this etude. Definitely work on your B major scale and B major scale patterns to prepare. Study carefully, make choices ahead of time about what fingerings are going to work best for you, especially the tricky spots that we've gone over. Be sure to show your dynamic contrast, especially in the obvious echoes in the main theme. Practice slowly with physical and mental relaxation. B major can cause us to really grip and get tight, so make sure you're staying relaxed in your body and in your mindset as you approach it. And finally, the end goal is for this A2 to sound light and easy and improvisational. And the challenge is to make it sound easy, even though there are some deliberate obstacles given the key, plus the little traps that are in the music. To listen to a beautiful recording of this etude and all other etudes from this book, head over to my website, clarinetplayground.com. Trevor Stewart has recorded all 40 etudes beautifully, and they are available for purchase there on my website. Feel free to join us in the Clarinet Playground group on Facebook where we play and post for each other. And head over to my website at clarinetplayground.com for more fun music and books. Thank you so much. <laughs>